welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point. I'm Bishin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTM page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at the point with LX at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We live stream Headline Buster on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Beijing time and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Friday. So do join us during the live streaming and get in touch. We would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments. First, a climate quiz. How many cars does a U.S. president need in his motorcade to talk about the environment and other issues? And the answer? 85. Yes, that's the number U.S. President Joe Biden reportedly had when he met with the Pope in Rome last week. Imagine the carbon footprint he left. And the double irony was that this happened right before he flew to Scotland to attend the U.N. climate change conference. Leading by example, indeed. Let's now look at the optics of COP26, especially the media focus, or shall we say, the media obsession. The two-week-long meeting has brought nearly 190 countries and 30,000 delegates together to speed up action on the 2015 Paris Agreement. The aim is to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees, compared to pre-industrial levels. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has emphasized how urgent the task is. The six years since the Paris Climate Agreement have been the six hottest years on record. Our addiction to fossil fuels is pushing humanity to the brink. We face a stark choice. Either we stop it or it stops us. And it's time to say, enough. Enough of brutalizing biodiversity. Enough of killing ourselves with carbon. Enough of treating nature like a toilet. Enough of burning and drilling and mining our way deeper. We are digging our own graves. A report released at uh, COP26 by the World Meteorological Organization says global sea level rise accelerated to a new high in 2021 with continued ocean warming and acidis acidification. But media headlines seem obsessed with other things. A bitter rivalry, a suicide pact and a supervillain. No prizes here for guessing who that supervillain is. China, of course. Even before COP26 started, the headlines wondered if Chinese President Xi Jinping would attend in person. Then they threw a tantrum on learning he would only send a written statement and said COP26 would fail due to his absence and then finally found fault with the statement. A headline in the standard goes, which world leaders are attending the climate summit and who's snubbing it? Did China snub it, meaning to ignore the meeting disdainfully? The Anglo-Saxons invented the English language, but they don't have the right to abuse it. There was little expectation anyway that President Xi would attend. He has by now made announcements about China's climate change commitments three times this year. So basically, his physical absence should not be the only thing that matters. This headline is so much ado about nothing to borrow from Shakespeare. And this New York Times headline is not much more sophisticated either. Who's attending? Biden and Modi, and who isn't Putin and Xi? What is it trying to tell us? At the end of the day, what really makes a difference to climate change? Attending one meeting or implementing what you have promised? President Biden was at COP26 for three days out of 13, but how much clout does he have, even at home, to make a difference? Even some of his fellow Democrats have failed to support a spending package that includes over 500 billion U.S. dollars to reduce emissions. He had wanted to have the deal in the bag to have something to flaunt in Glasgow, but no, he was there. The money wasn't. Besides the obsession with who will be there and who will not, some media seem keen on drumming up conflict, especially a deadly China-U.S. climate rivalry and blaming China for the failure of COP26 even before it started. 
like this uh, Bloomberg report, China-U.S. rivalry is the big threat to any climate pact. The report describes the two countries as rivals in everything, from space to artificial intelligence to racing for bottom spot in climate change action. The writer even wonders whether this rivalry will lead to a climate suicide pact. Yes, you heard it right, a climate suicide pact. Wow, that's some Shakespearean imagination at work. And more imaginative reporting follows. The China's economy is faltering, despite the IMF has uh, estimated 8% uh, growth this year for the country, and that China is sending out fleets of red trucks full of coal to trigger more emissions. And Beijing's emission control plan is a disappointment with few details. Now, exactly how does China's emission control plan look, alike? look like? Let's see. By 2030, share of non-fossil fuels in energy consumption is to increase to 25% from less than 16% in 2020. Carbon intensity is to drop by more than 65% compared to 2005 levels. And China will not build any more new coal-fired power plants abroad. I can go on. But you can see how detailed the plan actually is. In fact, some have said it is too detailed. But there is one detail which has rarely been picked up. Finance for developing countries to tackle climate change. In 2009, at COP15 held in Copenhagen, developed nations finally agreed to channel 100 billion US dollars per year by 2020 to help developing nations mitigate climate change. How have developed countries honored their commitment? An OECD assessment pub published this September shows that although climate finance grew slightly in 2019, developed countries remained, 200, remained 20 billion US dollars short of the goal. OECD Secretary General Matthias Korman said the limited progress is disappointing, particularly ahead of COP26. Isn't that? where the focus should be instead of targeting China for not making new pledges, how about honoring one's own pledge before fingering others? But in fairness, one article I came across does get the point. It's this Time report titled Economic Growth and Carbon Emissions Used to Go Together in Some Countries That's Changing. It says developed countries got uh, rich by burning fossil fuels for almost 200 years. Their emission levels dropped not always because they took positive steps, but because something bad had, something had gone wrong, such as the Great Depression or the Second World War. Wealthy countries still contribute much more per capita to global emissions, and they still bear much greater responsibility for the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere over the last 200 years. So their emissions cuts will need to be greater for the world to reach net zero. Now compare this with China. Developed countries generally set a time frame of 40 to 70 years to move from carbon peaking to carbon neutrality, while China has given itself just 30 years. With China being the world's factory and now going out through the Belt and Road Initiative, it is fighting climate change on multiple fronts. Is it ethical for some media to repeatedly shame developing countries such as China and India by calling them the worst polluters and trying to push them to do even more? When on Monday, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi mentioned India's pledge to reach carbon neutrality by 2070, the media called it ridiculous. Why? Because it seemed far behind the goal set by rich nations. As you think about that, it's time for a break. We'll be back to see the latest progress at COP26 and where China stands regarding them. Stay with us, and I'll also have three distinguished guests joining us. A piece of pristine land on the Tibetan Plateau, at an altitude of more than 4,000 meters. The Sanjiang Yuan area in northwest China's Qinghai province is home to the head streams of three major rivers, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, and the Lantang, which is named the Mekong in Southeast Asia. Some 60 billion cubic meters of fresh water flow out of the region each year, nourishing more than one billion people along the way. I'm here at the source of the Yellow River. Sanjiang Yuan isn't just known as the water tower of China or even Asia. 
The region also boasts rich biodiversity. Snow-capped mountains, crystal clear lakes, far-flung pasture, and diverse wildlife. Sanjiang Yuan presents an ecological landscape unparalleled in the country. But this wasn't always the case, especially in the last decades of the 20th century. Climate change and excessive human activities created devastation. Grasslands degraded, lakes dried up, and the number of wildlife plummeted. Back then, people swarmed to my hometown for goat mining, hunting, and defrosting. By 2000, there were very few wild animals. For example, the alpine musk deer almost died out, and snow leopards couldn't be seen. A conservation campaign started in the late 1990s. The government established two national nature reserves in the region. Since then, some 3.6 billion US dollars has been spent on ecological restoration. Another significant move came in 2016, when the central government decided to set up a national park here, made up of large portions of the two nature reserves. The purpose of establishing the national park is to protect the integrity and authenticity of the region's ecology to leave precious natural assets to future generations. After four years of trial operations, the Sanjiang Yuan National Park, the first pilot park in China, is about to be formally established. In the past, all the natural resources such as water, grassland, and forests have been under the management of different regulators. Now, all the functions are integrated into a unified department. I think this is a highlight of the reform. The strain of initiatives are paying off, as locals can tell. There are more than 20 infrared cameras in my village, and each of them has captured snow leopards. Bureau Chief He says the advent of the national park system is a milestone. But guarding the rare pure land will be a long-term undertaking, which calls for participation of everyone in society. Yang Jinghao, CGTN, Qinghai Province. China's new five-year plan aims to achieve green development with peak carbon emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. This will be a challenge to achieve as China is still in its process of urbanization and industrialization. Achieving carbon neutrality includes reduction in emissions and planting trees. Although China's emissions continue to grow, carbon intensity per unit of GDP had fallen by 48% in the 15 years up to the end of 2019. The new five-year plan aims to achieve a further 18% reduction in emissions to GDP intensity. Well, action has been taken to control high-polluting industries and improve the energy mix. China has also been making efforts to expand its forest area. Over the centuries, wars, fires, and excessive tree cutting reduced China's forest cover to around 8% by the first half of the 20th century. After the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, efforts were made to protect and restore forest resources, but progress was uneven. In 1978, the government approved the Three North Shelter Forest Program in an effort to hold the expansion of desert. Since then, the forest coverage in this northern region has risen from 5% to 13%. It now forms one of China's biggest strips of planted trees. Forest cover in China has been increasing now for four decades. Globally, tree cover in 2019 was up at 5% from the early 2000s, an area equivalent to all of the Amazon rainforests. And over 25% of the gain was attributed to China. 23% of the land in China was covered by forests in 2020, more than double the 1950s, and it aims to reach 26% by 2035. China is now determined to accelerate 
green development. Welcome back to Headline Busto. I'm pleased to be joined by three guests. They are Dr. Alexander Fischer, who is Director for Sino-German Cooperation on Climate Change of GIZ China, Professor Chi Ye, Director of Institute for Public Policy of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and Professor Howard Bamsey, Chair of Global Water Partnership of the Australian National University. Gentlemen, welcome to Headline Buster. First of all, let me go to Dr. Fisher. Um, we are five days into COP26. What kind of progress do you assess has been made and what are the difficult uh, topics that have been debated in um, Glasgow up to now. Thank you so much, Liu Chin, for the opportunity to join and uh, for having me. It's a great pleasure. We are five days in the COP26, as you mentioned. Um, I understand that the pledges which has been made, uh, if they all are implemented, we would end up at the 1.9 degree Celsius uh, global warming, which is below the two degree target. So from that point of view, I think the world leaders are on track with their announcement. Um, of course, uh, a COP is not the place to implement. It's a place for announcement, for paperwork, for wording, for negotiation. But I think this is quite remarkable, despite the tensions which you mentioned earlier in your moderation. Professor Chi, how do you assess the uh, progress so far at COP26? And uh, what is the biggest sticking issue here? I think the progress has been fine. The, uh, you know, the main uh, task for the negotiators this time is to complete the, the, the rule book for the Paris Agreement. And this including, uh, of course, the Article 6 and the other issues and finance, we have seen the uh, we're not going to achieve the finance target until 2023. On the other hand, and uh, some pro important progress has been made on uh, reducing 30% of methane between the 2020 and 2030. I think that that is a very significant progress. And we have heard uh, some other con major countries like India and made th their commitment for carbon neutrality by 2070. This is very, very important. I think the overall spirit is let's just consolidate the consensus on climate neutrality or carbon neutrality, and we go from there. This is the, the consensus itself, the very, very important. We have seen this emphasized by President Xi and other world leaders. The uh, Let's leave the divisive issues out and let's focus on the consensus and consolidate it and make very concrete progress. Professor Benzi, do you see progress being made uh, that uh, countries are trying to leave the divisive issues out and working and pushing forward the consensus and especially how to implement it? Well, I think so far uh, in the COP, uh, that's exactly the case. And uh, I think you'd expect that from the first couple of days, which have been the leaders' summit, uh, you would expect and hope to see uh, the, the, the momentum uh, gaining speed uh, as leaders pledge uh, their commitment to, uh, to, to respond to climate change. So I think we, we've seen a very successful start to the COP. Uh, there are now some, some details to be worked through and the, uh, the diplomatic negotiations will, will commence. I hope that, that, uh, that we see through the rest of the COP that the uh, consolidation, the, the sense of common purpose that's been so evident in the first few days, I hope that that's maintained. Let's focus a little bit on the kind of uh, media stories that people are reading and uh, I have been critiquing these stories because that's, you know, the, the obvious ones that we, the ordinary people, get their hands on. Um, there was one graphic which was particularly interesting was to put uh, the emissions of China and Russia together and, uh, you know, to compare that with uh, all the emissions put together by the US and its allies. I don't know. Um, how sophisticated, how professional it is from a you know, professional um, 
Industry Insider's point of view, but uh, Dr. Fisher, how do you look at these? Is the media really focusing on the right things or we really have to be able to tell um, you know, the noises from the most important information? Thank you, Lee Chun, for this very challenging question. It's important and challenging. Let me point it that way. Since the beginning of the process in 1992, I think uh, participants, the media, and, and also us as cooperation agencies, were looking for the key points how to push forward. And my, my sense is that the media is looking for trying to explain to the world and, and the broader population, as you mentioned, where we stand and how the situation looks like. Putting those emissions together is maybe a way to get attention. It will definitely not um, bring us implementation, but I must say more attention is better for the course. So I'm not per se against it why I maybe don't agree on this specific um, approach. Hmm. Professor Chi, what is your impression of what you have read from professional uh, information providers vis-a-vis -vis the mass media? Um, is the mass media doing a good job at conveying the kind of uh, hard work and the atmosphere that is really at COP26 vis-a-vis um, -vis the kind of sensational uh, headlines that they're throwing out? Well, I think every good story must have a context, and that's the, the, the media's job to... Uh, to make the public understand the, the the context and the real content, the uh, but on the other hand, we are now living in a post-truth world, and uh, unfortunately, and uh, we have seen some media, and uh, including some professional professional media and uh, social media, they are trying to catch the eyeballs, and uh, I. I understand, and uh, I am not, uh, you know, this, I'm not agreeing to that kind of approach. On the other hand, I think the, the professionals are the professionals, and they are trying to do a good job. And uh, and I hope the, the professionals, uh, you know, all come out and uh, uh, directly uh, face to the, the public and explain what's going on and uh, make the real story heard. Professor Bensi, what is the kind of uh, narrative that's being pushed on media in Australia, for instance, about, about COP26? Is it about the, the real issues that have to be tackled, or is it more about, you know, rivalry, geopolitics, and attracting people's eyeballs? Well, I think, uh, Liusin, that it's uh, in Australia, it's probably pretty similar to elsewhere, and the short answer is all of the above. I think. Um, you, I've, I've been speaking to, uh, to many reporters in, in the last week or so, and, and they've, uh, they've captured a spectrum from very detailed, precise knowledge uh, and astute questions about the key issues, uh, right through to uh, one reporter asking me, why is the COP important? So it's, uh, you know, there's a spectrum and there's a great variety uh, of, uh, of, of reporting uh, and uh, many, many of the reporters uh, have been following climate change for a long time. Many are brand new to it, and, uh, and, and some are serious, and some really are about headlines. So I think there's a great variety. Hmm. Let's look at the specific issue, which I think is, is quite important, which is the funding uh, for developing countries to mitigate the effects of uh, climate change. As I said, there is a 20 billion US dollar uh, shortage uh, to the 100 billion US dollars that is pledged on an annual basis. Dr. Fisher, exactly what is the problem here? Is this uh, lack of will, lack of resources? Why the reluctance? Thank you for that question. Also not easy one, but very important. I think it's a little bit of a catch-22. Um, on the one hand, the donor countries, if you want to call it that way, the developed world who are pledged to provide this funding, um, in their perspective, they do what they can and um, convince their population that their tax money has to be used to help developing countries to transition to a low-carbon economy and how important it is also for the constituencies they um, yeah, sort of uh, explain what they do with the tax money. And on the other hand, um, you pointed it out, the, the money needed for the transition in developing countries, Mr. Modi made his point yesterday, 
um, are so Im immense and enormous. This cannot be only funded by tax money alone anyway. So the private sector, the banks, the, the finance system, the, the, the large investors in the world um, are supposed to team up to, to fill this funding gap. And I think, uh, especially in the COP26 now in Glasgow, we see a certain momentum this really happening. Hmm. Professor Chi, your assessment of uh, the reasons behind the, the funding not being able to catch up its goal so far? Well, first of all, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Fisher that uh, the funding of the public, from public sources is not adequate, it's not enough to address such a big, huge challenge, the greatest challenge to humanity. On the other hand, we need to separate the public funding and the private funding. The pub public funding, which, which was uh, committed in, twin, uh, in 2009 and Copenhagen, that has uh, never been delivered, not going to be delivered until uh, an earliest 2023 at this moment, I think it's a, it's a very typical issue of collective action. You know, everybody count on others to fulfill the com commitment to deliver the goals. And while they want to be the free riders, I think that that is a very typical of a lack of a political will. This is this is something I think the, the developed countries must come out and um, make that the, the uh, to honor their own uh, commitment. On the other hand, private sources are very very important. Maybe even more important. The uh, uh, this is why we see the sustainable green finance, sustainable finance, climate finance that need to play a very, very big role. And also in the last couple of years, we have seen that developing countries are not waiting for the, the money from the developed countries. They are doing themselves to help each other by setting up this South South cooperation on financing and capacity building. I think we need all these efforts to work together. We can't wait. I mean, the, the the, the bottom the, you know, of the truth is we cannot wait for this and uh, we have to move forward. Professor Benzi, if you think about it, I mean, 100 billion US dollars for all of the developed countries is not that much, but why so no. difficult? Um, I, I think um, we can see in Glasgow already that they, the momentum we've been talking about earlier in relation to pledges uh, for uh, emissions reductions is also uh, a feature of the financing discussion. So in the last couple of days, we've seen a number of countries announce increases in their climate finance, uh, including uh, Japan, which is doubling. Australia has doubled its uh, climate finance. And in fact, uh, I think the latest assessment I saw was that even those uh, announcements of the last few days would see the $100 billion a year um, uh, commitment met in 2022. So yes, it's not done in 2020, but it's just a couple of years off. I think you can see that glass is half empty or you can see it as half full. And I think it does represent um, uh, in general, uh, a strong commitment from developed countries to deliver. Uh, and they will deliver, I'm confident. Now, I, I agree with Professor Chi, that's not enough. We need more, and there will be more. Uh, but I do think uh, what we're seeing is that the public finance that's coming forward is indeed simulating private investment. Uh, and those two working together uh, will continue to create further momentum, I think. And uh, as, uh, as the investment climate for climate friendly activity continues to improve and, and governments begin to uh, adjust their incentives so that uh, it, that's the, the, the smart money will increasingly go to climate friendly activity. I think we'll see that uh, finance will not be lagging long and that it will become available as, as required for, uh, for the, 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 the important task, the vital task of changing the direction of investment around the world okay. uh, to support the climate response. Yeah. Let, let's take a look at two comments we have received so far. Let me read them out to you. The first one says from um, Hong 
Artois. We had real Kyoto, Paris, and now Glasgow. What was achieved? Never mind, Liu Xing, as you rightly pointed out, we have to deal with climate change now and soon before we do not have a place to live. So this is one comment. The next one. It's hard to trust promises from the U.S. It's uh, common in Western countries for government lines to be volatile and market sensitive. China, on the other hand, has the habit of fulfilling its promise. It's from Louis Ramos uh, Lemos. So basically, we're looking at two issues here. I'm going to ask the, each of you, each of my guests, to comment on these comments. Dr. Fisher, you first. Basically, what has been achieved, right? People seem to have, some people seem to have a great sense of distrust or pessimism as to all of these meetings, COP26 by now. What has been achieved? Should we lose our heart? And secondly, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of commitments, especially for developed countries, uh, whether they're able to uphold. Thank you, Lucien, pointing this out, and Mr. Hong to ask these questions. It's good to put it into perspective, Kyoto, Copenhagen, Glasgow. And um, when I was in the German government and attended the COP meetings, uh, I also, of course, asked my questions, what are we going to achieve through these meetings? Uh, isn't it? Uh, yeah, sort of just a big fuss and, and thousands of people meeting and flying around the world, making extra emissions. Will it actually pay off? I, after um, deeply learn the importance of this gathering and how this um, shows the world that this is happening, I changed my mind into, well, actually, I think there cannot be enough people who are working on the subject and um, as more is better. For example, uh, I'd like to bring the example from the aunt group who set up the, the, the social um, uh, media network on uh, rescuing the forest where 500 million signed up. So I think there cannot be enough and these meetings may look not very helpful for the individual choices we make every day. Do I take my, do I buy electric car? Do I buy a fossil fuel car? Take, do I take the next plane? Do I install um, a, a solar panel on my roof? Of course, these are far away from my individual decisions. So I totally understand Mr. Hong's frustration about this. But at the end of the day, it will trickle down. And uh, China um, and Europe and also the US, they all moving in that direction to transition the whole economy in all our lives, while each individual decision also matters. So my, my, my advice is don't get frustrated and start by yourself and then I think we're all gonna get there. Yeah, Professor Chi, your comments and I also want to hear uh, what do you say about the kind of uh, capability to fulfill promises, right? Every country is making promises for themselves and what are the complexities and what are the different situations different systems have? For instance, in the United States, we have uh, President Joe Biden being very much hindered by uh, the kind of disagreement, right, between parties and even within his own party, whereas in China, it seems that China is able to push forward the goals that it sets for itself, but not without challenges. I have been a long critic of the, uh, the climate governance overall. I, I think there are uh, considerable room to improve for, uh, for instance, we do not really need 30,000 people to go to Glasgow for this big conference and to make a real progress, especially during this uh, big pa pandemic uh, right now. And uh, I, on the other hand, I do realize the political reality uh, does, uh, there are so many barriers, obstacles need to overcome. You just mentioned in the United States, the, the political system and uh, the president serves for four years and uh, uh, it's really hard to make any real progress during that short period of time. And you do need a bipartisan co cooperation to pushing these issues. And when there is a big fight and you, ha you have real trouble. And we, we realize all these difficulties and challenges. we we'll also need to realize this is by far the biggest challenge to human beings to test whether or not we can actually, all nations, all people can actually get together to face and address these huge challenges. And I think this is not time to, you know, uh, finger pointing on each other right now. And uh, and we, we, I agree with Dr. Fisher, and uh, we understand the frustration, but we need to move on. And, uh, you know, the, when your boat, 
we're all in the same boat. When your boat is broken, the leaking water, and we have to keep pedaling, and we have to go move forward while trying to fix all the problems. I think this is a this is a political reality we're facing, and while there is no other, no better system, no better ways to fix it, let's just work in good faith and fix the problems. Mm. Okay. Professor Benzi, I'm going to leave you with uh, the opportunity to do the concluding remarks here. Well, I agree with uh, with my colleagues. I think uh, we have no option but to continue. Uh, where we are, this is a this is a task for all of us, all of humankind. So, jayo. Thank you, thank you very much. I didn't expect that. So, with that, we are going to wrap up this edition of Headline Buster. Many thanks to my three guests: Alexander Fisher, Director for Sino-German Cooperation on Climate Change of GIZ China; Professor Chi Ye, Director of Institute for Public Policy of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology; and Professor Howard Benzi, Chair of Global Water Partnership of Australian National University. Indeed, let's jaiyo. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Headline Buster. Many thanks for having been with us. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lushin in Beijing. I'll see you in the next Helen Buster. <laughs>